All right. Um, many of you do know me. Some of you guys are just, you know, you, you heard about this uh, event and you've decided to come to this presentation. Uh, and, and mostly for those people, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and what my show's about and uh, why we have all these wonderful people that are part of our community today. Um, in 2008, I was very, very concerned about the state of the United States economy before everybody else was. When everybody was telling you, oh, it went down a little bit, but it'll be fine. The whole stock market's on sale. Buy more. It's great. It's wonderful. It's a great time to buy a house, you know, all of those things. And uh, I was working with a gentleman named Neil Franklin, who was a business partner of mine. And this guy's worth about, I'd say he's probably worth about 30, 40 million dollars. So he has the kind of financial advisor that you and I and most people like us cannot afford. And his financial advisor was telling him, no, it's not going to be okay. You really need to protect your assets right now. And uh, he was telling me this information. And there's only so much you can do with it. Because people like that operate on a level that most of us never will. But they are t tuned into the situation. And um, I was also working about 65 to 70 hours a week. I was uh, functioning like as a C-level officer for three different companies. And I was ready to go insane. My wife said the only thing that kept me from snapping out completely was my garden. Because I would come home, go through the house, out to the garden and water it. And after an hour of watering the garden and drinking two beers, I was okay again. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of people living like this. And there's a lot of people that are going to get hurt. And one of the companies that we had was a web development company. We had a client that wanted a podcast, and none of us had ever actually done a podcast before. So I figured, well, we've already won the job and told them we can build a podcast site for them. So maybe I better go figure out how to do that. Along the way, I'd been listening to this guy named Glenn Beck on the radio and screaming at him every time I thought he was wrong on the radio and, and, and kind of cheering him every time I thought he was right. And I realized I'm yelling at the radio and nobody cares. Maybe if I yell at America, America will care. So in June of 2008, I started the survival podcast based on modern survival philosophy. These 12 tenets that we're going to talk about today. And a month later, there were like four and a half people listening to the show. One guy only listened every other day, so he was the half. Um, by the end of that year, there were 2,000 people. Today, there's about 45,000 people a day that listen to the show. The show is now a full-time business for my wife and I. I hear from wonderful folks like you guys all the time about how you're changing your life and making your life better because of the show. And what I want you to understand is when I started this, you know, I was a country boy that got successful and got in debt and got all the problems that go with, with that. And when I started this walk back around the other side, basically I was saying to America, you guys are not alone. And along the way, that's what America said back to me. And it's really been an amazing thing. And what it's taught me is that we're not insane. We're not crazy. We just understand that like that guy with the bull on top of him, sometimes things go wrong. And if you noticed in that picture when I had that photo up, there was a guy running to his aid, a, a clown. Not the kind of clown they have in Washington at the, the Capitol building, but a rodeo clown. A guy that's actually skilled and knows what he's doing. And that guy's there to save his life. So even in that situation, there's a redundancy. There's a plan. And that's what I think we all need in America. And I think that's what's lacking today in America. Um, and I think if we're going to do this, we, you know, we talked about some extreme things uh, during the panel discussion. And people are always worried about the apocalyptic disaster, whatever the TV networks are going to put on next, or they're going to make a Hollywood movie about, or whatever. But I want to ask you some questions today. Uh, what's more likely to happen to you, honestly, see the honestly part at the end? A total collapse of the economy leading to a, uh, a road warrior scenario, you know, a global pandemic leading to a death of 50% of the population. In 2012, the world will end because the Mayans said so. Forget about Doc Bones telling you they didn't know about leap year. Um, we're going to use up all the oil, and that will cause a total collapse. There will be no oil left. I mean, they won't even be able to lubricate you know, your porch swing. A giant comet hits the planet and lends, uh, ends all life as we know it. Or anything else you can think of that Hollywood's made a movie about. Or would it be more likely that you might see something that's on this list here? And what I try to tell people all the time is if you've seen something in your life, unless you're really unlucky tomorrow morning and you happen to walk in front of a coal truck or something like that, you're probably going to see it again in your life. So you tell me if you've at least seen these things happen you know, on TV somewhere else in the world. Forest fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, riots, terrorist attacks, ice storms, we'll call them moderate pandemics. That's where only you know, half a million people die. Um, blackouts, fuel shortages, tsunamis, nuclear power accidents, flooding, economic recessions. Anybody ever see an economic recession before? Huh? Uh, coordinated attacks, hazardous material release, droughts, rapid inflation, volcanic activity, warfare, Genocide and ethnic cleansing, that's something we think we're done with, but we're really not, are we? This is going on in Africa right now. This went on in the Balkans back in the 90s. 
Uh, most of your kids were probably alive when this was going on in the Balkans, except the folks with the one-year-old over here. Um, the lone gunman scenarios and landslides. Is there anything on that list that no, somebody here has never seen any one of these events happen in our, our lifetime? So we're probably likely to have to deal with at least some of them again. So this is where our minds need to be as we start our walk toward preparedness. It's not that some major event can't occur, some global earth-shattering event, some real problems. You know, I, if you guys listen, you know I'm very concerned about where our economy is heading, but we're more likely to deal with those things. And here's some, here's some examples of where people, because something's more sensational, focus on it. In 2011, we had the largest tornado outbreak in the history, recorded history of this country. It may have been bigger, but not when anybody was here keeping books on it. Everybody remember 2011? It was a horrible year. Birmingham, Joplin, right? Uh, there's small towns in northwest Arkansas. They're gone. The towns, like, they decided they're not even rebuilding them, some of these small towns that got hit in northwest Arkansas. Um, but even with all that, only 566 people were actually killed. Uh, $25 billion in damage was done globally, and thousands of people were injured, lost their homes. But that is something we really look at and go, wow, that's something I'm really scared of. In contrast, in 2009, that, you know, this is kind of boring, you know, news hour stock market crash. American home values lost a half a trillion dollars. Half a trillion in home values lost in a single year. Um, six million Americans lost their job in 2009 alone. Six million, I, not to put any, you know, blight on these folks here, not that I don't have sympathy for them, but six million is a lot more than 566. And when you lose a job in your household and your family, it is a disaster. Who here's ever lost a job? Who here was really happy about it? Once I was happy and once I was not so happy, right? But it, when you're prepared, you actually can be happy about it. Because sometimes you lose a job and you go, I really don't want that job. And it's not sour grapes, you really didn't. But you've got to put food on the table and a roof over your head. If you've got that squared away for six months, losing a job can be a blessing. So that's, maybe that's the first disaster we need to start thinking about preparing for. Um, American stockholders lost about $11 trillion. And that includes little old ladies with fixed incomes. And uh, 35,000 people successfully committed suicide. Now, I'm not saying that they did this because of these things, but I can tell you that the average number of people that committed suicide before 2009 was about 28 to 29,000. So that was a significant uptick in the number of people that decided they wanted to check out early. And I, I would say there's probably, you know, at least a possibility of a correlation there. So when I put this show together and I put this philosophy together, I said there's something that I want to make sure absolutely never happens to a community if I'm going to build one. And that is I don't want people falling out. I don't want people doing what they did during Y2K. Uh, right before Y2K, there were events like this going, going on three to four times as large because everybody was building up on the hype. Uh, there's a great guy here who wrote a great book named James Stevens, and the first copy of his, the, the, book, the, co the edition of his book that he was releasing right before that period of time had a lot of advertisements from a lot of companies in it that were it was part of his book as a resource. Most of those companies are no longer in business. And when I decided I was going to build something in the preparedness industry, I didn't want it to be something that was going to run a cycle. I wanted it to be something that would benefit people every single day. Because this is the way I look at it. If we all would die tomorrow if we ate unhealthy today, everybody would eat healthy. If we would all die tomorrow because we didn't exercise today, we would all exercise today. If you walked out and there's a guy laying on the ground, right? And you say, well, what happened to him? You go, he ate bad today and he didn't exercise yesterday. You'd be on the ground doing push-ups. I mean, right away, right? Because it benefits you today. But because we don't see the benefits of exercise and nutrition, immediately we have a tendency to put it off. Well, when you look at something like emergency preparedness, it's the same type of thing. Sometimes it's even further out. It's, it's harder for us to see the immediate benefit. So my anchoring tenant was that everything that you do, to, uh, everything you do should improve your position in life even if nothing goes wrong. And if you look at some of the things that we talk about as preppers, we store food. If you store food and store what you eat and eat what you store, you're less likely to go, honey, I, we need three eggs, right? So I can cook something because your mom's coming over tonight. There's a convenience factor alone in storing food, even if nothing goes wrong. We can also save money storing food. I'll, I'll hold off on that because we'll go into each of these a little bit deeper later. But I just want you to realize storing food is not something we do just by buying 25-year storable food, throwing it in a pantry and going, eh, if we ever need it, it's there. We can make this part of our daily life. When it comes to paying off debt, has anybody here ever paid off a debt and then went, man, I wish I didn't do that? 
I've been screaming get out of debt for four and a half years now. I've got a lot of emails from people that told me why it's not really a good idea because their financial liar, oh, I mean advisor, said that it's not a good idea to pay their debt off early. But I have gotten also a lot of emails from people saying they did it and how great their life is. But I have never gotten an email that says, Jack, I paid off all my debt because of you and you're a jerk because you've ruined my life. What I've always heard of how great it feels when they get free of that. Um, installing alternative energy. I'm not about saving polar bears with solar panels. But I do know that if you're less dependent on the grid, if you can keep certain things up when there's a short-term power outage, that's a good thing. I also know if we can focus on efficiency and cut our electric bill, that helps me this month. And it helps me every single month thereafter. Um, owning gold and silver. Who here owns gold and silver? Who will give it to me right now for market value? Who will sell it to me for the price that it is at market? Nobody, no takers. I'll pay you what the, what the spot price is right now. Nobody wants to give it up, why? It, it, right, because they well, think it's gonna go up, and also doesn't it give you a level of feeling of security because you know it holds its value. So that's security. If we have security in our lives, in our minds, we make smarter decisions every single day. Um, and growing a garden. Like I said in the beginning, as I was, you know, I kind of grew up with the whole preparedness mindset, but as I was coming back to it, Growing a garden is probably one of the things that kept me from like, you know, going postal. I mean, seriously, um, it's very centering. I think if we could put a garden in the backyard of every home in America, we could get most of our kids off of Ritalin and we could put most psychologists out of business. I really do. And so that's an immediate benefit. But yet if something goes wrong, we're able to feed ourselves long term. Tenant number two, debt is financial cancer. Minimize it, pay it off early and stay away from credit cards. I know some of you get airline miles. I don't care. I don't think a credit card is a, a credit card is like a rattlesnake. If you are perfectly trained and know how to deal with a rattlesnake, you can have a rattlesnake. Most of us aren't. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to use credit cards to get airline miles or 1% cash back. I promise you, if you start paying cash, you'll be able to get discounts by asking for paying cash discounts of greater than the 1% cash back. So I'm not going to get too much on the credit card thing, except I don't think that it's a good idea. But I do want to talk about the similarity of cancer and consumer debt. Now, I want you to think about this. A person about 35 years of age that potentially has cancer, but doesn't know they have cancer yet. It's a very slow metastasizing cancer. A year later, they look like they're the picture of health. And it might go on for five years or more that they look like they're really, really healthy and the disease is slowly crawling throughout their body, and then one day they have a pain in their back or their chest or their leg, they go to the doctor, and at that point it's too late, the cancer has metastasized throughout their body, it was missed, and there's nothing that can be done. And it's fatal, it's terminal. Now I want you to think about a 35-year-old man that went through school on student loans and owes about $90,000 of student loan debt. His wife is in a very similar situation. By now they have a couple kids. The kids are in every activity, every event that they can possibly put them in because they want them to have more than they did when they were kids. They buy the most expensive house they can afford. They buy the most expensive vehicles they can afford. Occasionally they talk about paying down their debt with their financial liar, and he says don't do it because you have plenty of time left. You're young. And at 35, they don't look like anything's wrong with them. In fact, they look great. They drive Lexus SUVs. They belong to a country club. Their kids are doing great. Everything's wonderful. Down the road in a slightly less affluent neighborhood is somebody with the same type of job. The wife has the same type of job, but they work themselves through college. They pay off all their debt. They buy what they can afford. And they keep their debt low. They look much worse off than our friends up on High Street. 10 years, 15 years later, when that debt has slowly eroded the lifestyle, a lot of times that, that couple that looks so great at 35 is dealing with a divorce due to financial stress and their situation is financially terminal, they end up in bankruptcy. The people that live a little bit more meager of an existence, by the time they're 45 and 50, they're really getting ready to go into those golden years. What has been promised. We can only blame the system so much for what's gone wrong. We have to take some responsibility for ourselves. The fact that we've willingly become slaves to this debt monster is at least half of our own problem. Now, there's things that the system have done that's unfair, I understand that. But if we won't accept responsibility for the peace that we control, then what hope do we have? Because in case you ain't figured it out, no one's coming to fix it for you. And this is one of the areas that people don't think of when they think of survivalism and preparedness. But I've found that it's the most effective thing that you can possibly do to make your life more self-sufficient. Because if you hadn't noticed, a lot of things that give you self-sufficiency, they save you money long term, but they cost money up front. 
And if the Visa and MasterCard people have your money, you do not. And it's amazing how much that $5 item that you charge just because you got cash back ends up costing you long term. And it pales in comparison to ninety dollars or $150,000 worth of student debt or debt on a half a million dollar house because you want to live in a trendy area. I'm not going to lecture too much on this. I just want to really drive that home for you and explain to you why it's one of my tenants. Tenant number three, become a producer of food. Growing your own food is for everyone, not just eco-hippies. I remember when the garden movement back in the 80s was pretty much some old people left that were still doing it, and then the eco-hippies out in the West Coast were growing food, and that was it. Today it seems like everybody's doing it, and I think that one of the reasons is intrinsically, even if the people doing the gardening don't know they're preppers, that we're all preppers at heart, and I want to put something to you this way. We need food more than we need money, gold, guns, or electricity. 250 years ago, nobody had grid electricity. Didn't exist. Nobody even understood how it would work. People lived. Um, at one time in history, there was no such thing as a gun. It's actually a relatively modern invention, uh, gunpowder is. Um, gold, eventually we figured what it was when we were digging it out of the ground, but people have existed without gold. Uh, so, and, and money was a, a modern invention so that people could barter when neither side had what the other one wanted. So there's been times in history where people have lived without money, gold, guns, or electricity. I don't know a time in history anybody's lived very long without food. We have to feed ourselves. And one of the things that I learned very early on as I was putting all this stuff together is when you have food, getting more of it's easy. As long as you're not worried about feeding your kids tomorrow morning, you can always figure out how to barter, how to grow some more, how to gather some more, how to trap something. But when you're not going to eat today, it becomes very difficult to get more food. We put that garden in, we put those food production systems in, we get, yes, productivity during our high seasons, but we also get surplus that we can store. That gives us a buffer, and that gives us the time and the opportunity to deal with getting more when we really need it. Next, I want you to understand storing any commodity is a finite endeavor. You can only buy so much storable food, and even if you had a blue sky budget to buy it with, you only have so many places to put it. So eventually you're going to run out of storage space. So if we want to really put longevity and self-sufficiency into our food storage, we have to be producing some of it for ourselves. And there's a cliche. How many people have ever said, I've got to put food on the table? Anybody ever say that? There's a reason, because you do. Right? Clichés are always based in, in factual reality. I don't know how many people I know that have said, I hate my job, but I've got to put food on the table and keep a roof over our heads. Well, this is one way to put food on the table. The next one is, uh, when you produce, I want you to understand it's not just about producing directly like with a garden or with a fruit tree in your backyard. It's also learning how to do things like canning and dehydrating. Um, there's a huge resurgence of farmers markets, CSAs, community supported agriculture, local growers, roadside stands, there's tons of stuff like that. And when you buy at certain times of the year when these guys are in surplus, they have pretty good deals. In fact, you can buy stuff for a lot less than you can buy it in the grocery store. I've seen green beans at a farmer's market for 49 cents a pound. But what do you do with 20 pounds of green beans? Well, if you know how to can, you can them. If you know how to dehydrate, you dehydrate them, right? But if you don't, then you really can't deal with it unless you have an army that you're feeding. So I want you to understand when I say produce your own food, it's not just about this direct production, but a secondary production component that goes along with it. Hold on a second. This one usually gets applause. Tax is theft. The best way to combat it is to understand every legal deduction you can take or create. And I, I really believe that. I feel that tax is theft. Now, look, I say this all the time. If we had the best streets in the world, if we had the best schools in the world, if everything was being done wonderfully by our government and we weren't $16 trillion in the hole with an open-ended QE now, I'd be happy to pay my taxes. I really would. But I also look at Uncle Sam is kind of like a deadbeat uncle that's on drugs, that's living in my house, that constantly wants more money for me, and I really don't want to give him any more money because he's not being a good steward of what he has. And when I look at the effect of taxation, I think that it cuts into you two ways, and people understand the first way very, very clearly, that if I take 25% of your income away, that's 25% you don't have to feed your family with, to be self-sufficient with to work on things for personal liberty with. But you know the one that nobody realizes? The 25% you give them, they use to build systems that empower the state to take away the very things that you're working for. So that they can have a government bureaucrat telling some lady in Illinois that they're going to put her in jail for having a front yard garden. You know what? They can't afford to put a lady in jail for having a front yard garden, and it's not going on everywhere or anything, but this is one town that did this. 
if they don't have the money to pay the bureaucrat to go out and do it in the first place. By the way, that town, if anybody remembers that story, the lady's name was Julie Bass. Uh, you guys rocked because a lot of you guys that listened to the show called up that town. I don't remember what town it was. But you guys called and told them you were paying attention and you were going to support her, and that was awesome. And they eventually dropped the charge. I was going to have the audience call on a Friday. We had to call on a Monday. Does anybody remember why? Yeah, they weren't open on Fridays. The town was so broke, they couldn't afford to keep the lights on at City Hall on Friday. So we had to call on Monday with the phone bomb. But without that taxation, so I, you know, we've heard this, it's patriotic to pay your taxes. I think it's patriotic to pay the taxes that you have to pay, and it's very patriotic to use the same systems and loopholes that rich people do to pay as little taxes as possible. And I think that every dollar you keep is one dollar you have to empower yourself, and one less dollar that empowers systems against you. I think there's a lot of ways we can do this. First of all, I am not, uh, what's his name, uh, Peter Schiff's dad that's going to tell you don't pay your taxes. He's in jail. I don't want to go there. You have to pay your taxes. Um, but good accounting practices are, are, are huge. And, and understanding the deductions that you can take, keep everything. I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but there was a law passed several years ago where all your sales tax is deductible. If you have state income tax, you can deduct either the state income tax or the sales tax, whichever one's greater. And if the sales tax on items you buy is greater, that's the better deduction. My wife keeps every single receipt for everything we buy ever and runs a, a sum total every year to make sure that we take that deduction. Um, buy used items. If, 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 if you go over here and buy something used he has, there ain't no sales tax there. That's y'all's business, private, independent commerce. Um, barter and trade. Um, there are tax implications to barter and trade, but it's up to you if you really want to tell the IRS that you and your buddy you know, swapped fixing a car for cutting your kid's hair, right? I, I, you, you guys work that out for yourself. Um, and buying via interstate commerce. So I like to keep money in local economies, but when you buy something online, and it comes from another state, at least you're not paying the state sales tax on it. So anything I can do to avoid tax, I'll do. Uh, avoid sin taxes. I do not smoke, I don't think you should either, but if you do, and you're gonna smoke, consider growing your own tobacco. That's what built the country along with cotton. It's one of the greatest countries in the world to grow tobacco in. I don't know why anybody's given the state 450 or whatever it is a pack in taxes for a dollar and 50 cents worth of cigarettes today. Um, I'm a home brewer, I like to brew, I like to make meat, I like to make wine. Uh, that avoids the sin taxes on those. So there's a lot of things like that that we can start doing the productivity for ourselves and avoiding taxation. It's small, but it does matter. And I think as we get more and more successful in our lives, it makes a lot of sense to take away from the system by giving to other charities that we actually want to give to. I'd rather go out and find a charity that I know is taking care of people, I know is helping people that I want helped, and give my money to them and get a deduction on it than give it to the government. Because that way I know that there's people are being good stewards of my money. And if I give to an organization this year, and I'm not pleased with the way that they handle my investment, which is how I actually see it, then I have a choice next year to give it to someone else. If I give it to the government, I know I'm not going to be pleased, and they're going to still want the money again next year. Tenant number five, food stored is an exceptional investment. You can't, simply can't lose by storing food that you would eventually buy anyway. Uh, this goes back a few years, but it's probably more true today than it was then because if you ask a single mom if there's inflation, even though Bernanke says there isn't, you know what she'll tell you when she goes to the grocery store. But in 2007-2008, uh, common foods that you can store returned an 11% uh, return of investment. That was in an article by the LA Times. The reason, even though it's old, I cite that is because the LA Times is not exactly a bastion of cons you know, conservative media or alternative media. It's about as, as liberal as it gets. And that's their number, and I believe them. Um, I have five rules of food storage, common sense food storage. Number one, you've probably heard before, a lot of people here would tell you this one, store what you eat and eat what you store. And I think the best way you can do that is get yourself a cheap spiral notebook, throw it up on your uh, countertop, and every time you eat something, write down what it was. Every time your kids eat something, write down what it was. Even if it's something that I would nutritionally disagree with, if it's what you eat, it's what you eat. And if it'll store for more than six months, start buying two instead of one until you have six months worth of it and then do it with something else, and then do it with something else. It's one thing to go ahead and store food for a year and buy all this long-term storage stuff, and there's a place where that stuff comes in, but getting the 30 to 60 days of sustainability, folks, it's real easy to do with the stuff you buy anyway. If it's in the center of the grocery store and it's not refrigerated, guess what, it's storable. So those things that you're buying like that, just start building the depth of that pantry. Start doing what's called copy canning. So if there's a certain canned good that you buy, and you're gonna buy one this week, buy two. When you use one, buy two more. And just do that until you build up whatever duration you want. The other thing is, as you start to do this, you can do something that sounds really sophisticated. It's called a, a CapEx deferral. 
And that means that we buy things when they're cheap. It's how Southwest Airlines continues to make money while everybody else loses money. They buy gas contracts on the gas when it's as low as possible. Now, the other airlines could do this. I guess they're too busy figuring out how to grow us next or something, so they don't do it. Um, but, uh, but you can do this with your food. If you have four months' worth of a particular food item, and it's highly priced this week at the store, guess what? Don't buy it. When it goes on sale, then you buy it. So you start to build up this financial reserve and start to see your investments in the things that you're going to use anyway and do this CapEx deferral. As complicated as it sounds, it's not. You know what to do. You have a coupon, you buy it. You don't, you don't buy it. It's on sale, you buy it. It's not on sale, you don't buy it. Now, if you don't have any reserves, you don't have that choice. If your kids expect something this week and you promised it to them, well, you're going to end up paying top price for it. Real, real simple. Um, when you get to the commercial long-term storage stuff, the Yoders, the Mountain House, all that stuff, it's great stuff. But what you want to do is you want to use it as extenders and adjuncts. So like the other night we were at, uh, what's that Italian place, Carino's? Johnny Carino's, right? So we're at Johnny Carino's and the guy says, what do you want as far as the soup to go with your meal? And I said, well, you got, he says, I got sausage and lentil. Brings it out, I'm like, this is awesome. And the first thing I told my wife is, I said, I can make this out of preps. I can use Mountain House sausage crumbles for this. I can use dehydrated carrots and tomatoes because those were two things in it. I can use chicken uh, bullion because it's a chicken stock base that I can tell that this is made out of, and lentils store forever. And so what that's an example of is there's only one 25-year shelf life food that's specialized in commercial that would go into a recipe like that. So I think it's important when you buy this long-term storage food, start to ask yourself, how can I integrate this into what I'm doing? Go ahead and open a can, learn to cook with it, and if you go, this sucks, don't buy that one anymore. Please try these different foods before you buy a case of it. That's a lot of number 10 cans to go through, even during the apocalypse, if you don't like it. But if you start trying to use these foods now, you'll learn how to integrate them with the food from your garden, the food from your pantry, and that way you'll be able to extend. Because if you want six months to a year's worth of food storage, which I think is a great goal, you're going to have to go to some of these. It's just, not really, uh, it's just not really practical to try to do it all with eat what you store and store what you eat. Uh, again, I've talked about this before, so I'll kind of gloss over here, but become a producer, grow, harvest, and store, and combine your techniques. And the big thing is, with food storage, seek a holistic solution. Don't think that you know, just ordering a couple of pallets of food to your house and sticking them in the garage is going to solve your problem. Learn how to integrate these things all together as a, as a common solution. Tenant number six, prepare for disaster based on the most likely threats you'll face as an individual. By the time you prepare for the most likely disasters, you'll be prepared for just about anything. So this kind of goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning. Think about this. Is it more likely that one person will lose a job or will have a total economic collapse? Right? It's probably more likely that one person, I, guess, I guarantee you somebody's losing a job probably right now getting a call on a weekend, somewhere in this state. So we know this happens. So that's maybe where we need to start. Is it more likely we're going to see localized riots or a global pandemic with a 10% death rate? There's localized riots going on in the United States right now. Um, earthquakes or a global nuclear war? Which one's more likely? All right. Um, a trucker strike or a new ice age, right? When, we, when I look at these things, it led to me what I led to what I call an order of probability. So I'll read this line across the bottom here for you: individual, local, small region, large region, national, global. This is where the media focuses: national and global. This is makes good Hollywood movies like Waterworld and Red Dawn and all that stuff. And this is the reality that most Americans live with a threat from on any given day. But these affect a very small number of people per occurrence. So what seems crazy, but true, is there's an inverse relationship between impact scale and probability that you'll experience it. And what I mean by that is the less likely it is to affect a large number of people at one time, the more likely you are to experience it as an individual. And it, it, it's hard to think that way because we've been trained by TV and media to think exactly the opposite way. But again, who here's ever lost a job? Who here's had a spouse that's lost a job? Right? Who here's ever been in the middle of a global pandemic when you weren't dreaming or watching it on a movie, right? So I'm not saying this stuff can't happen. I'm saying that this is what's most likely to impact us. So let's start here. Let's start with some of these mundane things like debt elimination, basic food storage. And when we get squared away as an individual and at a family level, let's start thinking at a local level. Let's start thinking about localized weather events like tornadic storms and things like that, flooding, and small region. And when we get this 50% done here, 
what we find out is by the time we get to here, we may not be 100% on this, but we're in pretty good shape for it. And it's like when I used to coach people in business and they say, I want to make a million dollars a year with my own business. And I'd say, have you ever made $10,000 a year with your own business? No. Okay, let's start with figuring out how to make that $10,000. And they'd get kind of dis disappointed about it. And they'd say, but no, that's not what I want. I'm like, but 10,000 is on the way to a million, isn't it? You've got to get there first. So I think that if we take this very practical entry into preparedness, starting at the family level, it's very easy to progress. Because who here, when you first started really getting into this, felt overwhelmed at some point? Right? Lots of people, right? It feels overwhelming. Like, I can't possibly do all this. This soft entry allows you to do more than you ever thought you could. Tenet number seven, alternative energy is for creating independence, not for saving polar bears. Your solar panels on your roof will not save a polar bear, but they will cut your electric bill. They will give you independence. They're also the most expensive form of electricity known to man. But do you know what's more expensive than solar panels? No electricity. So if you're off grid, it's a really great, great advantage. Um, but here's what I think we need to do with alternative energy. The first thing we need to do is focus on efficiency. So boring things like radiant barriers, uh, boring things like additional insulation, boring things like more efficient lighting, boring things like when you leave, turn the light off. Right? Those that have heard Paul Wheaton on the show know that he has an extra word he adds to that that I won't say in a public place. Right? But I mean, that's, that's really where we're going to start at. The next is, you know, build a simple backup power system. There's really expensive rolling solar backup generators, and I'm not real, you know, $2,500 for something that will run your refrigerator for 35 minutes. Uh, I don't think that's a good investment. But, you know, with a couple car batteries and a charger and an inverter, you can build a backup power system. If you don't know how to do it, go to Google and type in build backup power system, and it will tell you how to build a backup power system for free. It will tell you how to put the stuff together and do so. Once you do that, go out and get a small generator. Two, three, four K gen set. Good extension cords to go with it. And you've got something really cool now when you have these two. Because I can use that generator to charge the backup battery power system while the generator's running to do other things. And because of that at night, I can bring that backup power system in because it's passive. It's just batteries, maybe in a roller box. And I can use it to run things in different parts of the house without running extension cords all over the place. And if I'm in a situation where kind of civil breakdowns going on, and I don't want that generator out there going all night advertising my presence, I can at least still have some electrical usage at night when security needs to be a little bit higher. So it gives me this added flexibility. Now I can go out and get some solar panels or a little wind system or both, and I can tie them into my backup power system. So now I have an alternative way. See how we're like, piecing it together a little at a time, starting with efficiency at the top, slowly building this up. Once I do this, I can maybe do something like build a passive solar heating system. You know, if I take a black box and I cover it with a piece of glass and I put a hole in the bottom and a hole in the top, and I take the hole in the top and I take a tube and I stick that inside a window, and that's a little bit oversimplified version of that, and I put that on the south side of my house, it will heat my house like you will not believe. It's that simple. There's a great book you can get called Sunshine to Dollars by Stephen Harris that tells you exactly how to do stuff like this. Simple things like hang black plastic behind your curtains on the sunny window sides, and that black plastic will heat up, and the air that flows out of the back of your curtains will help to heat your house. These are simple, low-tech things that can be done. Steve's book even tells you how to get free glass. And I'll tell you how to do it so you don't have to buy the book to get it, even though Stephen wouldn't like that. Um, a lot of times if you just look in your yellow pages and look for companies that do glass work, new windows and replacement and mirrors and stuff like that, and call them up and ask them if you can have old glass that they want to get rid of, they'll say, come get it. Uh, Steve's got a picture in his book where he basically filled his Dodge Ram pickup truck, the back of it, with huge pieces that would be very expensive to buy glass. It's all mismatched and doesn't quite all go together, but when you're building little you know, projects like that, do you really care? Uh, you can also, sometimes you can even come up with free solar panels. I'll tell you a trick to do that. Um, when you drive in somewhere and you see a construction site where they have the little signs that are flashing and tell you different things, right? And they got little solar panels on them. Go look on the back side of the sign. You'll see the company that the state or the city or the county's leasing them from. Look that company up, call them, and ask them if they have any broken or chipped solar panels. A lot of times they'll give you away uh, those panels. Even though they're not perfect, they do usually still function. Maybe they're running at you know 60 or 70 percent efficiency, but 70 percent efficiency for zero dollars is a pretty good deal. Right? So there's, there's ways we can do this and be creative and learn. Because as we're doing this, next thing I want to do is I want to add a more powerful generator system. Right? 
When I, when I kind of step up now and I'm looking at something that's more like a whole house system, or at least maybe 7,500, 8,500 watts, I can run most of my home, or at least the parts of my home I need to be comfortable with a system of that size. The next thing I want to do is maybe consider going to large scale solar or wind or a combination. But guess what you've done? When you built this backup power system, added a small generator, and then added small scale solar and wind to it, you built a scale model of a whole house electrical system. And you probably now, except for the parts that can kill you, can do most of the work yourself. So you're teaching yourself along the way. Um, you know, it's a very practical thing to, uh, to build scale models of systems before you try to build them large. In this case, you've built a scale model that actually does something for you. So that, that's kind of my approach to alternative energy. And I think it makes a lot more sense than just phoning up a company and dropping down a check for 35 grand for a solar system that's only going to do half of what you thought it was going to do. Um, next one, owning land is true wealth. Owning productive land is the primary means of creating systemic independence. I'll tell you a quick story. A uh, long time ago, people started coming to this country from all over the world, before it was even a country, when it was still a group of colonies. And a lot of, there's a lot of romanticism about what really brought people here, but I'll tell you what really brought people here was land and land ownership. It was one of the few places where you could come own a land and not be a serf. Instead of a nobleman owning the land and letting you farm it, you could own your own piece of property. And up until not long ago, it was still one of the few places where you could do that. A person would come here and maybe work in a factory, even though they weren't a slave or an indentured servant, they would work like they were for three or four years, save enough money, and go out and find a little piece of land and homestead it. And then the fact that it would make people cross the ocean to know that you can have a piece of land and you can, you can make it do whatever you want, and you're entitled to keep everything out of that. Now, there's a lot of things that have held that up today. You know, and got in the way of that. But it's still the biggest single piece of wealth you can have is productive land. And I think that that's something that we should all be striving for is land ownership and making that land productive. Having a piece of dirt that doesn't do anything is really not that valuable except maybe in your real estate portfolio or things like that. I want land to produce food for me. I want something I can hand down to my children. I want something that, that when, when I look at it, I feel great about having it, but I also feel secure because I have it. I think we should pay off our mortgages as fast as reasonably possible, but in spite of my comments about debt, uh, mortgage debt is something I'm okay with. The interest rates, especially now, are so cheap. Uh, it, it, it would be hard for me to write a check and pay for a house, even if I could, unless I really could pay for the house three times over. Um, but I do think that you know, taking 30 years to pay off a house is probably not what we need to be doing. And I think the reason that we do this is we've gotten into a habit in America where we buy a house so that we can buy another house so that we can buy another house so that we can buy another house, so that one day we can buy another house. And then we wax nostalgically for our grandparents' day and age, and we think of what it was like back then, and why can't America be like that? Your grandparents probably bought their first house as a young married couple. They probably moved into it. They probably died there. They knew their neighbors from the day they moved in to the day they died. They wrote, raised your parents there. Your parents probably brought you there as children. You probably remember the place. If you want the America of your grandparents, act like your grandparents. I mean, it's, it's that simple, really, isn't it? And they probably took that house. They probably took that house, and as the family grew, they probably grew the house. Folks, there's nothing preventing us from doing that now, except, you know, we've been sold a lie that it can't be done anymore. Or we've been sold a lie that it's more important to live next to a trendy area or whatever it is. If we want to make our homes something we value instead of something we resent, we have to turn them back into homesteads. And we do that by finding a place we want to live for the rest of our lives. And whatever's not right about it, instead of looking for it somewhere else, we fix it. We make it what we want. And then we hand that down to future generations. We have the blueprint. It was left for us. Let's just follow it. It, it really is that simple. Um, I do think improving the energy efficiency is one of the big things we need to do for independence. I, I really encourage you to think about getting away from the large urban areas. And I don't necessarily mean out in the middle of the mountains or whatever. But just not ground zero. If you go out your front door and you can count 20 houses, you know, to me that's a little bit too close. I'm not quite, um, I remember it was, it was, I think it was Davy Crockett that said if he could see the smoke from his neighbor's chimney, they were too close. I, I'm not that much of a hermit, but I understand that when situations go wrong, that people have a tendency to act a fool. And I'd rather try to hold a community of 10 or 20 families together than try to hold a community of 200 together. I really think it's easier to do, and I want to be part of the solution. I just don't want to be the prepper that like 
when everything falls apart, I'm just going to take care of myself and my community is going to go, go to heck in a handbasket. I want to be out there fixing it. But if I'm in the middle of a suburban place going into riots, that's almost impossible to do. I also think we have a lot lower property taxes if we move a little bit further out. And a lot of the things that I'm talking about doing, like adding on to your home on your own and putting in systems, there's these things called HOAs, you know, and they're really, you know, heavy in the urban areas and they get in the way of things like that or owning a chicken or a duck, you know, and, and I want freedom in my life. And if I have to move out to get freedom, I'll do it. And it's something that you notice this is personal choice. If you want a homestead in downtown Los Angeles, God bless you. Go do it. And do it right and do it so good that you influence others and they do it too. But personally, I'm going to take a little bit easier of a route on that. Um, I really encourage you to learn about permaculture. We talked about it a little bit in the panel. All I'll say is if you just Google the word permaculture, you'll find tons of stuff on it. And you will find granola chewing, tree hugging hippies going, yeah, man, permaculture's the way. Do not let it turn you off to the word. Do not let the fact that somebody ruins a word ruin the word for you. Permaculture is a system designed to create a permanent culture of humanity. Can somebody give me a better definition of survivalism? I, I mean, I really can't think of one. I think that the best thing we can do as a society with being prepared for disasters is try to get as many people prepared as possible so that when there is a problem, society doesn't break down. And I think permaculture is a great way to do that. And I think it works better. I'm not worried about saving the environment in the way that that's usually said in the media. I'm worried about doing things in a way that works better, that are more sustainable, that requires less work and effort for myself and my family, and something that will function for 100 years or 200 years instead of 10 days before it needs to be upgraded. That's what permaculture is about. Um, you, I also really think it makes a great, it's a great idea to do things like utilize small livestock. We talked about that. Chickens, ducks that lay eggs, it's a great protein production system. There's parts of the world where that is their primary protein source. And they require so little effort, but again, you gotta live in an area where you can do it. Uh, aquaponics is something I'm very interested in. I haven't done it myself yet, but I see amazing opportunity with productivity out of aquaponics. Being able to produce fish and plants, and they both take care of each other. Uh, that's something I really recommend, especially urbanites, that maybe if you can't have the small livestock, but you can have that aquaponic system in your greenhouse in your backyard and nobody even needs to know what's in there. Uh, fish don't make a lot of noise. Even when you fillet them, they don't make a lot of noise. Um, and then greenhouses. Some do catfish, but the rest of them just kind of accept the fate. Um, greenhouses, uh, you know, <laughs> if you live in a northern climate, this is a pretty well a southern climate with a decent growing season, but even here you can benefit a lot with a greenhouse. We put in a 12 by 20 greenhouse. Uh, the amount of productivity that'll take through a winter, even in a southern state, is huge. People that live further north, though, I mean, it, it, it's almost mandatory. It gives you a lot of freedom as well, and it can be multifunctional. Right now, the last thing I want to do is put a plant in my greenhouse. It will die. It was Until this week, it was up over 100 degrees every day. Uh, but my wife just cut a huge amount of uh, sweet basil, bundled it up, took it inside the greenhouse with all the windows and doors open, and hung it in there. And guess what? There's your solar dehydrator. Right, so during the time of the year where we want to do the most dehydrating, we can dry herbs and things like that in the greenhouse. We don't need a solar dehydrator. The stuff that needs to be dehydrated faster, we use an Excalibur for. But, you know, I think a greenhouse is a huge uh, functional thing. But really think about where you put it. Make sure that your greenhouse is put in a place that's optimized for where the sun is in the winter. Right? A lot of people go and they, they put their greenhouse in in the, you know, mid-spring, late spring. And they go, well, the sun's here, so I'll put my greenhouse here. And then in the winter, the sun is, you know, a lot lower in the sky. There's a great app you can get called Sunseeker on iPhone. I think they have it on Android as well. And you just hold your phone up and you set the date you want, like the summer solstice or the winter solstice or the equinox. And you can take your phone like this and it'll show you each hour of the day where the sun's going to be. And that way you can see where your solar exposure is. And that's huge for your productivity on your land. If you're building a house, please face one of the main sides of it south. So you can heat your house for free in the winter by letting the sun come in on the south side. Then plant a little thing called a pergola. So it's like a, you know overhead cover. And plant vines that'll grow up on there with leaves on them that'll fall off in the wintertime. And that'll shade it out and keep you cool and give you a nice cool space outside of your home in the summertime. And when the leaves fall off and the solar angle lowers in the winter, it'll help heat your home. See how simple that is? But when we started building subdivisions where the roads just went wherever they fit on the map so we could cram as many houses in there, things like this went out the window. 
if you're building a house, I really recommend you get a hold of a good permaculture consultant to help you do these things. Not even designing your house, just say, where do I put the house? How do I lay it out? Where do I, if you get a chance to do that building a new home, do it. Because you can make decisions then that'll impact you for the rest of your life. And here's the key, you're gonna make decisions then that are gonna impact you for the lifetime of the property. Whether you make them right or wrong won't matter, right? So uh, a few bucks invested in that might make them the right ones. And then another thing, who here has a dream of maybe one day owning 10 or 20 or more acres? Who would like to do that? Yeah, me too. I really would. We're probably going to settle for five. But I want you to realize that an acre may be more than enough. Who here owns a property of about an acre? Are you full, fully utilizing everything it could do for you? You are. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. See? And it, it's a lot of work, even one acre, if it's intensively managed. So realize if you get the right place where you have the freedom to do what you want, an acre or two may be more than enough. And you may need to buy three to get one really good, flat, workable acre. But, you know, sometimes we don't really need what we think we need. The biggest reason I would like about 80 acres is so I can leave 40 of it treed in a circle around my property and then have 40 of it opened up with all my stuff going on in there just so nobody can see me. Not because I want to hide anything or run moonshine or whatever. I just want to be left alone. Right? I mean, that's the big thing. So when I look at property, if I have to go for smaller property, I just want property that's located in a way where I'm not really on display to my neighbors, not just from a security standpoint, but just so they'll leave me alone and let me do what I want to do and not call code enforcement because I put up a fence that's one foot lower or taller than they think it should be. Tenant nine, do not ignore pragmatic preparations such as insurance, emergency cash funds, and long-term investing. All the stuff that your financial advisor should be talking about to you that he doesn't. Um, because he says just save 10 or 15 percent of your income whatever it is with me and he'll say things like have a 90-day emergency fund but when you don't have a 90-day emergency fund does he say wait to put your money in my account or does he say let's start your investments now so where's the 90-day emergency fund going to come from um, i think insurance life property etc is huge at least to meet the replacement value um, any any of you out there that are earning income in your household and that income is helping you and your spouse provide for what you have today that do not have enough insurance to cover the loss of your income when you are gone are wrong. I hate to tell people you're wrong, but you are because your spouse is depending on you. It's not that expensive. And if you need to do it with short term term or whatever to get it as cheap as possible, if you want to do like I was talking to somebody yesterday about insuring a uh, mortgage. So I have a 20 year mortgage, let's say, and it's going to get smaller every year. You can buy something called 20 year declining term which means your insur the insurance value of the policy goes down every year. It's dirt cheap because that, that policy is specifically for the house. So whatever you need to do to make sure that you insure your contribution, do it because when you're gone and one of you will likely go first and, unless you know, there's a catastrophic event where both of you are in a car together or something, the people you leave behind are going to depend on you. So please make sure that's taken care of. Um, Include real commodities in your investments. The investment advisor always wants to talk about your 401k balance and how much money he has under management because that's what he gets paid on, right? And the 401k is his retirement plan too. It is. Now, this is your financial advisor's plan. I'll build this huge book of business, right, of, of money that's out in the private sector, and then I'll have this 401k annuity waiting for me when, when they retire and I retire at the same time because when they leave their job, we'll roll that into an IRA. It'll come under my management and my book of business will grow. Isn't that great for me? Yay. Right? That's why if you're going to use a financial advisor, I like ones that work for fees instead of commissions on, on balance book, uh, book uh, management, uh, the assets they have under management. Because they're going to give you the best advice they can because they're going to charge you every year the same amount. They're just going to give you recommendations. But I really recommend you take more control over yourself. But when I say real commodities, I just don't mean silver and gold. I mean tools that will last a lifetime, right? I mean a barn that you build on your property or an outbuilding you build on your property that does things for you. I mean a, an orchard of trees that are going to last 20, 30, 50. Some, some fruit trees last 100 years. I want you to start seeing all of the things that you put into your life that are going to last more than five years as part of your portfolio. You'll start to value your property more, your family, your life, your community. Well, you know what we protect, folks? We, we protect what we value. We protect what we value. If you don't value where you live, either fix what's wrong with it or find a place you will value where you live. It will change your life. Because you'll protect it, you'll invest in it, you'll work for it. And when you start to see it this way, it becomes a lot more powerful. Next one, do not put 100% of your savings into retirement accounts. 
I know your financial advisor tells you to. I've just told you why. You might actually need some of your own savings before you retire. I know it's shocking. I know it's not something you think of very often, but occasionally we need this stuff called money. So I really recommend you have two baskets that you put your savings into. One is long-term retirement, and the other is short-term possible needs that could be long-term. It's just there. Now, I say this is becoming more and more critical as I'm watching the government start to eyeball all of our private retirement accounts and start thinking about doing things to help us. What I've learned is when the government helps me, I'm never happy, ever. And if they help me with money, I'm not just not happy, I'm sad. I'm very, very sad when they help me with money. So what I want you to understand about retirement accounts, it's the most publicized and legislated money you will ever hold. So make sure you have some that's maybe not everybody's business. And I'll tell you something I've discovered, some of you guys listen to the show regularly, may have heard this already. A lot of your 401k plans have had the cash options removed, money market accounts and things like that, they don't exist in there anymore. Your safest fund is a bond fund. And guess what kind of bonds are in there? US government treasuries. Why do you think they're doing that? To force your money into their Ponzi scheme. And I'm not saying it's not safe, because if a, if a government bond becomes worthless, so does a dollar. That's, that's not really the point I'm making. The point I'm making is they know they have a problem, and they're doing everything they can to keep forcing money back in, because they have to turn the debt over every year. So check your, check your 401k plan. Go ask your HR person or your, your representative from your financial services company, do I have a cash option in my 401k? And don't be surprised if a lot of you don't anymore. And when I start hearing things like that, I start saying maybe you need to think about putting less money there and go to an IRA or go into a non-tax deferred investment so that you can control the money and do what you want to with it. Uh, you can't have freedom if you don't have freedom with your money. Um, here's a big one, and I get a lot of people that seem resistant to this at first. I do not believe in saving money so your child can go to college. I, I don't. I think if your financial advisor recommends a thing called a 529A plan, which we put money into, you should punch him in the face. I really do. Here's the thing. You don't know that your two-year-old's going to go to college. I know that everybody tells you that they're supposed to go, and I know that you think they're supposed to go, and I know you believe your little Johnny or your little Susie's going to be really, really smart and go to MIT. Not so much. Who here went to college? Who here that went to college? Keep your hands up. Everybody went to college. Keep them up sat at least the next to one person while you were in college that you knew did not belong there. Keep your hand up if that's you. More hands went up. Okay, that could be your kid. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your kid. I never went to college. Lectured at a few, but never went. College wasn't right for me, not because I wasn't smart enough to do the work because of my personality and because of my path in life. Um, I don't, I'm not saying not to save money so your kids can go to college someday. I'm saying don't save it as college money because you'll make dumb decisions with it, like 529 plans, and you have $45,000 sitting there for your kid's life, and he goes, I want to fly helicopters. And you go, yeah, well, you got money, you can go to helicopter school, and since it's not an accredited university, it's a 529 plan, he has to pay penalties to get his own money for his own career the way that you would if you took money out of your IRA early. That doesn't make sense to me. We shouldn't be taking a lot of risk with money being saved for college anyway, so there shouldn't be a whole lot of gains to pay taxes on anyway. We should have that money very safe and very secure. I believe in what's called a life establishment fund for your child. You know, if my son came to me at 22, 23, 24, 25 years of age and said, I've researched this, I have a great idea for a business, I want to take that money and I want to invest it in myself and I want to build a business, rock on, son, go do it. But guess what, if I've locked that money up in an educational account, he can't do that, can he? Or at least it costs him a lot of money that he could otherwise have for that. There's a lot of opportunities out there other than college. I'm not putting college down. I'm just saying it's not for everybody. And that lie has created another giant debt bubble. The debt you can never get away from, student loan debt. They will garnish your Social Security, if it still exists, to pay back your student loans. And uh, for that reason, I think we should really be encouraging our children to take out as little debt as possible when going to school as well. And uh, have a will and keep it updated. This is, my, this is my entire pitch for why you should have a will. If you don't have a will, then you're trusting your government to do the right thing with your money when you're dead. Get a will. Tenant number 10, have a means of defense, acquire the knowledge, training uh, to use it effectively. Um, who here was ever told in school 
that when you turn 18, you should go register to vote because if you don't vote, one day you could lose the right to vote. Anybody was ever told that in civics class or whatever? Yeah. Uh, when you turn 18 and you can legally own a firearm or 21 and you can legally own a handgun, you should go exercise that right so that you don't lose that right because if you don't exercise that right, you might lose it. It applies to all our rights, not just the ones that they want to tell you about. So I really believe in the Second Amendment and I believe the best way we do that is by being responsible gun owners. I also want to tell you that something that I always have to put in all of my presentations, not everybody is your friend. There's a lot of people out there that if somebody's nice or smiles the right way or talks with the right language, thinks that person won't hurt them, we have a word for those people. It's called being a victim. And I, I want you to have what's called situational awareness. I want you to pay attention. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to be paranoid. I don't want you to not trust people in general, but I want you to not trust people in general. I want you to let people earn trust. Somebody knocks on your door and tells you they're you know, with the water department, and look, there's something wrong with your water and we can fix it for you. That's an old scam. They put sea monkeys in a test tube. It's just one example. And they give you a test tube and go, go fill this up in your sink. And they do a little David Copper wheel switcheroo and go, look what's in your water. Write a check to the water company. It'll be rebated on your bill. That's one example of a scam that was run very successfully many times. If somebody will use sea monkeys to take your money, they, use, they will use violence to take your life and your property. Just, just really take that in seriously and understand. I talk to a lot of women that tell me that they don't have a gun and they don't want a gun, they don't have nothing against it, but they don't want to get their concealed carry permit, they don't want to carry, they don't want to touch guns. They, they, their husband has the gun and he'll defend them. My first statement is your husband isn't everywhere you go. And if he is, I want you ladies really to think about what I'm about to ask you right now. Let's say your husband is armed, he is trained, you're in a situation like we had recently at a theater uh, in Colorado and your husband has your back with his gun. Who's got his? Who has his back? Aren't you supposed to be there for each other? You know, and if it's not your thing, I understand. I'm not trying to beat up on you. I'm just saying think about it that way. Really make an informed decision. Don't make a decision on firearms based on bias or what the media has told you or your fear. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, don't ever make any decision based on fear. Remove the fear, then make the decision. Then you're making a logical decision. You want to feel powerful, go out and get professional training on firearms usage. Know how to use it safely. I promise you, you'll become a defender of the Second Amendment and your household and your community and your family overnight. Um, when it comes to guns, I do have some recommendation. Number one, I just said, get good professional training. And then I believe in a good four gun battery, a good shotgun, a 22 rifle, a center fire rifle, and a good personal defense handgun. You can pick the order you buy them in. The 22 rifle is awesome for training small game, things like that. We carry handguns because they won't let us carry rifles everywhere and they're not practical. For home defense, people often say, I want a revolver for home defense. Get a shotgun for home defense. When you shoot people with a revolver, sometimes they die, sometimes they go out and shoot back at you, sometimes they go out and go away. When you shoot people with a shotgun, they go down. Seriously, right? The reason we carry handguns is because of practicality and legality, right? For home defense, a shotgun or a carbine is the way to go. But once I have a lot of people say, well, I have this you know, thing and I have 10 other guns and I have all this, and I'm deciding now between gun A and gun B, what do I get? My, my next question for them is, when's the last time you had a good training class? And not just the class you took to get your permit, right? And they say, well, like five years ago, well, we get more training before your next gun. Invest in yourself, invest in your skills. We only need so many guns. Your skill with a gun is what makes the gun useful. It's what makes it valuable. It's what makes it effective. And I, I want to say that take this across the board with everything in your life. Sometimes it's not stuff you need to be investing in. A lot of times it's you, your skill set, your knowledge. Your, whatever does it for you, whatever is really you're passionate about, invest in that for yourself. And uh, I also think you should carry non-lethal self-defense. Do we have? Yeah. I do not get paid for this. I don't, Lynn from Cold Seal won't even return my phone calls. Uh, but I do believe in recommending the best product I can get my hands on. This is what we use. We use it on keychain holders and smaller packaging. We keep these in our house. Velcroed under the windowsill by the door. We have one Velcroed under the table, the kitchen table. It's called Inferno from Cold Steel. And uh, it's made with just hot pepper. You could, you could eat this. It's non-toxic, but you don't want it in your face, right? It really, really hurts. It's made of 95% capsaicin and 5% black pepper. Do you, anybody who wasn't here yesterday know why they use black pepper? What's that? Yeah, you inhale, it makes you sneeze. So you get hit with this and the black pepper and it causes you to go, Phew! 
oh great, well this just went down your throat, up your nose, in your eyes, everywhere, uh, and becomes very persistent. I've watched a video of this done, they brought in like martial arts fighters, MMA guys, big tough guys, and it agreed to be sprayed in the face with this, and held up hand pads for him and said, hit the, you know, continue to fight as long as you can. The guy that made it the longest made it two strikes and he was on the ground like a baby. The reason I recommend that you carry something like this though, is if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in spite of everything I said about self-defense and the Second Amendment and carrying a gun, I pray to God I never have to shoot anybody. I really do. I don't want that burden in my life. And if I can avoid it, I can avoid it. I also uh, had a neighbor with a pit bull dog that got really, really aggressive with us one time when we were walking. I had a 9 millimeter on one side of me and this on the other. And I gave a little spray on the ground in front of the dog and she backed off and went away. And, you know, it's much easier conversation with your neighbor going, dude, um, your dog is, like, reckless and was going to bite me, so I sprayed it with spray. And you need to, like, you know, rein your dog in rather than go, dude, here's your dog. Right? That's, that's not a conversation you want to have. But that could be a human life as well. So make sure you have a non-lethal form of, uh, of defense as well so that you only have to use lethality when necessary. But I also want you to train yourself mentally and physically so if you ever have to, you can. Because there's people out there that won't care that you have second thoughts about it. They really won't. 10 and 11, build a, uh, build a disaster documentation package and keep multiple identical copies for all family members to use. Anybody here ever hear of the wilderness rules of three? Three seconds, three minutes, three hours, three days, right? I have the evacuation rules of three. You need three destinations you would go to if you have to leave. You need three routes to get to each destination. And you need three rally points per route. Because it just might turn out that your husband's at work, you're at work, and your teenage daughter's uh, in high school, and you guys can't go home before you got to leave. It might be nice if you knew where you were going to go and where you would meet each other. Because then maybe everybody wouldn't panic and do what they're supposed to do. And if everybody has an identical documentation package with this information in it, and you have your teenage daughter freaking out going, Dad, Dad, I can't do it, you can say, Honey, turn to page four. Look at that map. Look at route A. Daddy will meet you at the first rally point right there where the truck stop is. All right. And another thing is understand that during one of these evacuations, you may not be able to stay put. They may come along and tell you, you have to keep going. So we've done simple things like come up with some markers that we keep in our vehicles. That would be if my wife got there ahead of me and she was told she had to move on, very inconspicuous but very noticeable to me, left on the ground, would tell me I've already been here if we can't get together by comms. So I would get there, I would see this thing laying on the ground or on the side of the road, and I would go, she's been here, I'm not going to wait for her. I'm going to go meet her at the next rally point. See, human beings have a capacity to do something that we don't know of any other life form yet anywhere, anywhere in the universe that can do, and that is to think ahead and plan multiple redundancies. Use that power. It's your birthright. And simple things like this. That's so simple what I just told you. Um, but it, it's something I've not even actually heard anywhere other than on my show to do something like that. And, and, and I, I think that each one of you has the capacity to come up with something that would take us to another level as a group. So work, think, use your mind in these things. Make sure in your documentation package you have all the contact information for everybody you'd ever want to contact. Key account numbers and personal ID numbers are a great idea too, like bank account numbers and all. I know what you're thinking. If I have my bank account number there and this gets stolen, some identity thief can use it. Use simple number encryption. Um, you could use, let's say, a two positive number encryption. So if the number was one, two, three, right, it becomes three, four, five. And if you're the only one that knows that, unless NSA gets a hold of it, you're probably not going to have a problem. Bank account numbers, if you put a one in front of them, use this encryption number and a zero after them and some dashes in them, they look like phone numbers. But you'll still be able to know what it is. You might need that information. Don't do it just electronically. Print this stuff out, and, but do it on a computer so that every time you need a new copy, you can print all the new stuff you need for all of the copies so everybody in the family has the same thing. I can't tell you how valuable it would be, like I said, if another family member is hysterical on the other end of a cell phone line or a radio or something like that, to have that calming, centering effect of being able to look at the exact same information and say, this is what we're going to do now. Uh, next, uh, contact info for service providers, merchants, support organizations. Things like tree trimming companies. I know guys that say, I don't need to know the number to us, Splenda. If a tree falls on my house, I have a steel chainsaw. I'll go cut it off myself. What if it lands in the middle of your bed while you're sleeping there? You're going to send your wife out there who's never used a chainsaw to clear the tree away. Or what if you're not home? Or what if you got sick? 
right? So it makes sense to have organizations and groups in your information that can help you if you're not able to do what you normally would do for yourself for whatever reason it is. Because here's the thing, as this stuff starts getting cleaned up in these localized events, it's first come, first serve, guys. So it makes a lot of sense to have that information as well. And at least three copies, and these things belong in your vehicle. You know, maybe one in the home, one in each vehicle. When your kids get a car, make one for them, have it in their vehicle as well. Most important tenant I have, guys, develop and implement your own personal plan you have full ownership of. There was a lot of things I said today, and I saw almost every head in the audience do this. And there was a lot of things I said today where I saw a few heads in the audience go like this. When you feel that way, don't do what I said. I mean it. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. Do what works for you. Pick and choose the information. Assemble a plan for you. My plan cannot, will not, will never work for you because it's my plan. It's for me in Arkansas with a wife and a grown son. And you might live in North Carolina with three young children under 10. And you might have half my income or double my income. I don't know. I have no debt. Maybe you have a lot of debt. Maybe you have no debt. I like livestock. Maybe you don't like chickens. Maybe you're allergic to chickens. I don't know. You have to make and build your plan for yourself. It's the only way you'll follow it. If I gave you a plan instead of 12 tenets of philosophy and said step one, doom, two, boom, three, boom, you'd do it all the way until the first one you disagreed with and then you wouldn't do the rest. So I don't do that. That's why we built a community you know, instead of an institution where I'm like the leader and overlord, Lord Jack. I don't want that job, right? I just want to be a member of my own community and help you guys. And that's why I present things the way that I do. Um, I do want to say a few things here, though, toward the end. Now, how you think is more important than what you possess. There's a lot of stuff here that's really cool stuff that you can buy. And I'm not saying not to buy it, because if I do, they'll throw me out, right? But the reality is what you possess in here and what you possess in here are the most important things you'll ever possess. My wife said when stuff went wrong in Haiti with the earthquake, she said you could have had a year's worth of food in your house. If your house fell down on it, your food's gone. Right? But if you know how to purify water and you know how to wildcraft food, right, that doesn't go away unless the house falls on you and then your troubles are over. Right? So focus on yourself and your knowledge. I also want to reiterate what I said at the beginning in the first tenet. People only do things they consistently see personal benefit in. So figure out how to convince yourself that this is good for you now, and you'll do it. If you don't, if it's just for tomorrow, you'll put it off. And uh, the golden rule of survivors, what you do matters. What you do is more important than anybody else uh, out there would ever lead you to believe. I've talked to a lot of oncologists, cancer doctors, and they've told me that the patient that's a pain in the butt they want to know why, why, why is there another option? What is this? Why are you giving me that? Even when they follow the same course of treatment, when it's a serious illness, when it's something that's like 70% lethality, 70% terminal, the patient that's a pain in the butt survives more often than the complicit patient that acts like a cow simply because they know what they do matters. They fight more. I do have some minimum recommended steps for you. Number one, I think you should build a bug out bag. I did a whole presentation on that yesterday. Uh, that's a 72 hour, hour kit. Uh, if you go to my site and just search for bug out bag, I've done plenty of, uh, plenty of shows on it. I think you should create a minimum, absolute minimum of 30 days of self-sufficiency in your home. I'm going to tell you, I think it's a disgrace that as Americans we don't have that. We live in a land of such plenty where food is so cheap compared to the rest of the world, where things are so available for the, compared to the rest of the world. There is no daggone excuse for any American not being able to just stay in their home for 30 days and survive. It actually makes me physically ill when I think about the number of people that couldn't make it a week. I think it's our civic responsibility as Americans to make sure we have that as a minimum. And I don't think 30 days is really that hard. I think you should develop your documentation package that we just talked about. I think you should grow something of your own even if you're an apartment dweller and it's just some basil and some thyme on a deck. I think you should get in touch with the fact that it takes effort and work to grow your food and sometimes things grow wrong because it will change the way you think. And I think it can change your life, as simple as it sounds. Uh, I, again, want you to not put 100% of your savings into retirement accounts just because, you know, you might need some of that money before you retire. Uh, I want you to pay attention. Have that situational awareness. If you're pumping gas with your iPhone earpods in, you are wrong. It's a great time to get mugged. 
And that's just one example. I'll leave it to you to think about other things, but please pay attention to what's going around, on around you at all times. Develop and follow a debt elimination plan. I tell people get out of debt. They say, I'm $60,000 in debt. There's no way I can get out of debt right now. No, you can't, but you can write a plan and you can start working on it. And if you start working on it today, you'll be out of it one day sooner than if you start working on it tomorrow. Anybody can develop a plan. Anybody can write a budget. It doesn't cost any money except the ink and the pen. If you ever tell me, Jack, I'm so broke, I can't afford the pen to write the plan, I will give you a pen. Email me, tell me where to send it, I will mail you a pen, I will even mail you a pad of paper so that you can do that part of it. So there's no excuse for not getting out of debt. Um, learn what you can eat that grows wild in your area. Everybody should know at least five plants that grows within a mile or two of your home that you can eat and use as food. Um, if we ever get in a situation where people have to go that far, everybody will figure out eventually the early bird gets the worm though, right? And in this case, the guy that knows that you can eat dandelions gets the dandelions first. Or that realizes those stinging things that are called nettles are actually really good high protein food. As long as we know how to pick them and use them. If you pick nettles, wear gloves. Once you put them in steaming hot water, guess what, you can eat them. Another good use of nettles, just to throw here at the end, if you have a garden that people are stealing from, plant stinging nettles in your garden. It'll stop the problem. Um, Make sure you have a means of purifying water other than boiling. Berkey's a great system. That's why I have Jeff as a sponsor. Uh, those that don't know, uh, that maybe are new listeners or just showed up here today and don't know who I am really other than what you've heard so far, sponsors on my site are not like sponsors on most people's shows or sites. They can't just show up and go, I want to be a sponsor and give me money, and I'll say, okay. I have a listener ad council that vets the sponsors out, 26 people. If two or more of them vote no, they don't get on. If they can be standing there with a check going here and I can't take their money. I set the program up that way and I took my power away to make that decision with one caveat. In addition to that, every single one of my sponsors is a personal endorsement from me. I own their products, I use their products or they wouldn't be on my site. So it's a two-folded approach. So when I recommend the Berkey guy, I'm making a very sincere recommendation on that. Um, and the last one, assemble a little blackout kit. You know, just lighting, heating, cooling, your, your, you know, stuff to keep your freezer running. Just basic stuff so when the power goes out, you can figure out what to do next. And, and if you start here, right, then you can get really, really prepared. You know, you can worry about buying a bomb shelter later, right? And I'm saying not to. I want one of those. As soon as they put a big screen TV in it and surround sound, I'm buying one, right? Um, but start simple. And... Think about why we're doing this. Um, I use the term survivalist. I do not use the term prepper. And I don't have anything against the word prepper. I, I really don't. It's a softer version of survivalist. But I'm not afraid of the word survivalist because I want to survive. If I'm standing in the middle of the road and a bus is coming, I'm going to get out of the way. That's as basic as it gets. But I'm not doing this just so I'll wake up breathing tomorrow. That's, that's not really what it's about. It's about my family. It's about my community. It's about my nation, it's about my country, it's about everybody here listening to me right now. I'm doing this because I believe that there's value in my nation, I believe there's value in the people around me, and I don't just want to survive, I want to thrive, I want to do well. I want to adapt to whatever comes my way, and I want you all to do it with me. And if we don't do it, who will? I mean, that's a very serious question to end on. If you don't do it, who's going to? Who's going to look after your family if you don't? You know, I care about you, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'll do what I can to help you, but I've got my own family to look after. Who's going to look after your neighborhood if you don't? Who's going to look after your town if you don't? Who's going to step up? Who's going to take care of your kids if you're not there? One of, the, one of the biggest things I hear from people is I'm willing to die for my family. And I want to leave you with this thought. If you care about your family enough to die for them, live for them. Because you can't do it if you're not there. Ron was just flashing 10 minutes at me, so I've only got five left to take questions. And um, I'll be here, so if you don't get a question, just find me and, and, and I'll ask. But I can take a couple of real quick ones. The name of the book is Sunshine to, the Dollar, Sunshine to Dollars by Stephen Harris. Q3 
QE3? Is that what you're asking about? What is it? How I think it's going to work out? Really, really bad. Um, <laughs> basically, for those who don't know, QE3, the president or the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, announced they're going to buy $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed bonds every month until it works. <laughs> um, I actually think it will work short-term eventually, and it will lead to a, a really uptick in the economy that will end with a really big downside on the other side. At that point, that's, they've, they've kind of played their last, uh, played their last chance that there's nothing else they can do after that. And you're looking at a currency revaluation is what I, I think you're looking at. Don't ask me exactly what it's going to be like or how bad it's going to get because I don't know. What you're going to see is a big shift and I want you to be prepared for it. I can't hear you. Uh, wasp spray instead of uh, pepper spray. Um, you can. I don't want to be sprayed in the face with wasp spray. Technically, though, in our litigious society, I wouldn't do it because it says right on the can that it's against federal law to use it in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. And this works really good. So I, I wouldn't do it. Now, if it just happens to be there, yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going I'm to break now. And I'm going to like kind of hang out behind the vehicles if anybody wants to come chat.